the Interim Director of Services for Students with Disabilities and Director of Adaptive Sports and Fitness within Student Life at the University of Michigan. I always give a visual description for those that are blind or low vision or any sighted individual who may be tuning in from the car, operating room, or while making lunch in your children for your kitchen to turn classroom for our virtual learners. The visual descriptions that people see if you are sighted contribute to how you are able to fully engage in conversations. And for those of us that are not sighted individuals, not having that access significantly impedes your ability to fully participate. Today's conversation is being live streamed on YouTube and will be recorded for those unable to join us live or for whom watching this later is a more accessible means for them for a number of reasons. Participants can use the Q&A throughout the discussion to submit questions for panelists, and we will try to leave a few minutes at the end to answer these questions. But I already know that it is unlikely we'll be able to address them all, so we will have opportunities to do so after this as well. In order to increase the accessibility of this session, we also have CART services, which stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation or Computer-Aided Real-Time Translation providing live, accurate, and reliable transcription of the exact words that are spoken for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, have limited English proficiency, or benefit from a live transcript for other reasons. We will also have American Sign Language Interpretation Services provided throughout. We have a great panel for you today. So to kick us off, Dr. Matthew Wixon, could you please introduce yourself? Hello everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Matt Wixon. I use he, him, his pronouns. I consider myself a young black man with brown skin and short black hair. I'm currently wearing round glasses that are blue. I'm wearing a blue shirt and amazing blue paisley tie along with a white coat. My background is a white wall with a TV and a cabinet and the two chairs. I currently am a, an assistant professor of anesthesiology uh, within the medical school. I also serve as the associate chair for diversity within my department. Uh, as well as the Director of Medical Student Education for Anesthesiology. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Dr. Wixon. And next we have Dr. Jade Burns. Hello all, um, I'm Dr. Jade Burns. Um, for my description, I am a young to middle-aged black woman with brown skin. I'm wearing a black blazer and I have shoulder length hair with some blonde highlights, just a few. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm sitting in my office at the School of Nursing, and behind me is my desk, bookcase, some beige walls, and a few fake plants, okay? Um, as I said, I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Michigan uh, School of Nursing. My research broadly uses technology, such as social media, and messaging in any virtual space to increase access to healthcare and sexual health services for adolescents and young adults. More, more specifically, youth of color and young black males. I have worked in urban settings such as the city of Detroit for over 15 years, serving youth in multiple capacities, community, academic, and clinical. My areas of expertise in clinical practice as a pediatric nurse practitioner is adolescent healthcare, family planning, health promotion, and HIV STI prevention. However, for the last decade, I have collaborated with an awesome community partner, which I will mention, Detroit Community Health Connection, which has allowed me to, uh, intersect my research, clinical practice, and actually see firsthand what people face in terms of health and healthcare in urban settings. Um, today as a panelist, I hopefully I will get to share my thoughts about the impact of COVID-19 and the communities of color um, and so much more. I have a few main messages, but I will, can, I will keep it moving. But I did wanna tell you that I am fully vaccinated as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns. And we're fortunate enough to have two student panelists as well. Kennedy, could you please introduce yourself first? Hello everyone, my name is Kennedy DuBose. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a young black woman with long curly hair, brown skin, I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm currently in my dining room. Um, my painting is in the back, it's not my painting, but I have an abstract painting in the background and my alarm system. I'm a senior at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I'm studying community and global public health and minoring in Afro-American and African studies. And some of my interests include epidemiology and global health. And I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Aris Bryant. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Aris Bryant. My pronouns are she, her, hers. 
I am a young black woman with brown skin and dreadlocks that are straight and about shoulder length. I am wearing a black sweater, turtleneck, as well as a blue multicolored tie with a silver and pearl brooch. I am currently sitting in a room with white walls and a brown door, um, as well as a news article and graduation photo hanging in the background. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit where I attended Renaissance High School, went on to Yale University, and I am currently going to graduate from the University of Michigan with my MD and Master's in Public Health and Health Management and Policy this May, after which I will be attending residency in family medicine. I am also fully vaccinated. Thank you everyone for introducing yourself as panelists. I think we should, should start by addressing why we're here. Before this session started, several of the panelists had already reached out to me because while 2020 in particular has been a year that has been fraught with social injustice, civil unrest, political discord, even today, there have been conversations happening on our campus that have sort of incited some consternation, ire, anger, and just concern in those of us on this panel, and I'm sure those of you that are watching. And so why do we need to talk about health disparities and social inequities? I think it is important to have these conversations and not just for ourselves and our communities, but for those who look to us as an example of what it should mean to be the leaders and the best. So I hope that this is an open and engaging conversation that goes beyond just pointing out criticisms and making complaints and hopefully ends with some tangible action items that we can take so that this just doesn't leave as a conversation that lets people say, hmm, I didn't know that was happening. I never knew people felt that way. I never knew those things still existed. So I think we'll start with Dr. Wixon by saying, what do you believe has led to some of these health disparities that we continue to see? Thanks, Dr. O. Uh, obviously, that's the question we're here to start digging into, and I think we'll spend the next hour uh, trying to address some, you know, individual uh, individual aspects. Uh, but when I reflect upon, you know, this big global question of why are we where we are, you know, I think you have to think about what is structural racism. You know, that is a, um, a hot button word in, in certain circles. Uh, but I think you, you need to go deeper than just saying it's structural racism, that's what it is. You have, to, you have to dive in and say, you know, what's behind that? You know, for me, when I reflect upon it, um, it's a history of policies and procedures and behaviors that have driven certain people groups down uh, as others rose. You know, I think about redlining and housing discrimination, you know, the inability to access, you know, wealth creation has led to, has led to some of these disparities. Um, you think about education policies that have been discriminatory. Um, it's really every facet of life that has been touched by inequity that has collectively over decades and centuries have led, um, has led to these uh, disparities. So those are just some of the things that immediately come to mind. It's the, the structures that have been created uh, that have led to our uh, differences in, in care and access. Thank you, Dr. Wixon. And I know that I love that he's really just sort of trying to lay the foundation because as you will see throughout the rest of this discussion, our panelists will then dive deeper into some of these things. And so, you know, if you hadn't heard this phrase before, by now you've all certainly heard of the social determinants of health, which I sometimes like to refer as the social contributors or even the social impediments to health, wealth, and access. Dr. Burns, what racial and social inequities and inequalities contribute to these social determinants or contributors? And what are the implications of those here? Thank you for that question. Um, so we know through the literature, the news and social media that inequity has been a hallmark of this pandemic, both locally and globally. Inequities in health have always existed, but at this moment, there is an awakening to the power of racism, poverty and bias and amplifying the health and economic pain and hardship imposed by this pandemic. 
So when we talk about the social determinants of health, these inequities um, have put racial and ethnic minority groups at, in, at increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. And just to review them, if you, you know, if you did not know, some of them are discrimination, uh, which includes racism and can lead to chronic and toxic stress and shapes socio, excuse me, social economic factors that put people at risk. Healthcare utilization, um, those folks who are more likely to be underinsured. Your insurance card should not dictate your health care. Healthcare access can also be limited for these groups by many factors, such as the lack of transportation, childcare, or the or the ability to take time off of work. There are language barriers, cultural differences, and all this is uh, historical in, um, within our current healthcare system. Also people's jobs. Um, we have more people from racial and ethnic minority groups that are disproportionately represented in essential worker settings, such as healthcare facilities, farms, factories, grocery stores, and public transportation. We look at educational income and wealth and wealth gaps. We also look at, look at housing. Some people from racial and ethnic minority groups live in crowded conditions that make it more challenging to follow some of these prevention strategies that have been proposed. So me, working in the city, um, both research and clinical, when we look at places like Detroit during the pandemic, for the first time ever, for black and brown folks, they've been connected to a primary health care primary healthcare provider. The implications as some of the uh, social determinants of health that I listed above um, include uh, access to primary care, care services, appropriate testing, vaccination, and transportation. We know that insurance matters, as I stated before. The population is faced with not how are you, but what kind of car do you hold? And so with this pandemic, we know that we've lost about 70,000 Black lives to COVID. Um, we know that there have been poor experiences when attempting to access care. Um, seeking health care um, has not been the best experience. Uh, the, the survivors, COVID survivors, have had more severe disease, uh, more severe disease course um, than their counterparts. There are also disparities when it comes to the digital divide, making appointments, secondary appointments, whether it's primary care or even with your first or second vaccination, being familiar with electronic medical record portals, and even if people do have a smartphone, how are we, you know, helping them access stuff like the QR codes that we see, even Zoom, even though we've been on it for a long time, FaceTime, Duo, all of it. So to end this, despite the current distribution and mass vaccination, there is a clear gap. And it you know, messes sometimes with people's thinking. Um, it raises anxiety. Um, there's just so much to think about um, within this time. So, but we understand that there's a sense of awareness that we need to serve our people better. So it's just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns. You know, some, some of you may know that I gave a TED talk about what I call the, the double dose of disparity that we are currently seeing due to the simultaneous pandemics of racism and COVID-19. Eris, you know, I know Dr. Burns started touching on some of these things, but what have we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic about the disproportionate impact that the virus and its resultant mitigation measures are having on our Black community right now? Thank you, Dr. O, for asking me that question. Um, it's very important. And um, building on what Dr. Burns and Dr. Wixom were saying, the COVID-19 virus, um, as Black Americans, we're at higher risk of getting infected. And even though we make up a smaller part of the general population, we make up a bigger part of COVID-19 deaths. Um, and so just thinking about that and the the impact of patients who get COVID, but also the impact and the strain it puts on their friends, their families and communities. This is something that's impacting more than just the people who get sick with COVID. It's impacting, as I said, their entire community. And so I think that it's important to, to realize that for one, um, and then the strain that it puts on the health system. As we were saying, the black community, we typically suffer from systemic things that cause us to have worse health conditions than other races. And so people with chronic conditions are having more trouble accessing the healthcare system now. Um, and for, for one, I had a grandfather who was in and out of the hospital during the last year and ended up passing away in December. And I unfortunately, due to the pandemic, was not un was unable to see him. And this is his tie that I wear in honor of him. And so just, just thinking about the fact that, that I'm not the only person who has experienced that. And when we are making up such a huge proportion of, of COVID-19 and, and what's going on that, that we are definitely negatively being up, impacted by that. Um, and then just thinking about the, the ways that we try to mitigate or 
to make this pandemic better, right? So we try to get more testing, we try to social distance or isolate or quarantine. Um, and, and just thinking about who has access to that testing. Do you have insurance? Do you have a car to get to that testing site? Can you afford to miss work and, and pay your bills if you're isolating or quarantining? Um, and then when it comes to this, this new vaccine, how, how can you trust in a system that has, to, that has traditionally made you feel like you shouldn't trust it? When it comes to things that were more direct, like the Tuskegee trials or, or forced sterilizations of minorities, right? Or, or more indirect things like the high infant and maternal mortality rates that we see or culturally insensitive care. These are all things that can make it hard for, for us to, to trust new innovations, to trust that, that these um, things that we're putting out to make things better are, are actually good for me. And so now we're faced with not only dealing with the pandemic, but also dealing with, with can, I, can I have faith in, in what's supposed to be helping me and what has been proven to be safe can actually do that for me. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's what I would, would add to the conversation. Thank you, Eris. And I know that we, we try to have a diverse panel in terms of where people are situated in this institution and the perspectives that they bring. So Kennedy, where do the public health systems factor into this conversation? Thank you for that question. Um, public health infrastructure definitely plays a large role in driving disparities in COVID-19 because there were disparities that existed even before the pandemic in terms of um, access to adequate health care. So as previously, previously explained, um, there were other conditions such as where Black Americans grew up, live, and work that are just unjust compared to white Americans. So really the foundation of Black health is built on inequity. Um, black hospitals in Black communities are often less equipped and underfunded. And um, there was also an article by the Washington Post that I think I read that it described that hospital segregation was still a thing in the United States. So on top of this, there are also barriers like lack of transportation to medical facilities and lack of health insurance and a myriad of other barriers that Black Americans face that make them less likely to seek or receive adequate medical treatment, which leads me to my next point. So I want to touch on comorbidity. So it's, it's important to examine the relationship between the racial disparities and the risk factors for severe illness, such as heart disease and asthma and severe COVID-19 illness. So there's this cumulative disadvantage where Black Americans are more susceptible to pre-existing chronic diseases and in turn are more at risk for severe or fatal COVID-19 illness. Um, Black Americans are more at risk for um, COVID-19 hospitalization, but as I've described, hospitals in Black communities are often under-equipped and inadequately prepared due to a lack of funding and resources. So for Black communities, it often feels like an impending doom because of all of the barriers placed in front of us, and it's almost like an inevitable loophole leading to death for Black Americans. Thank you, Kennedy. Now we've tried to encourage people to then put things in the chat and the Q&A. And while we have the discussion that we hope to have here, I want to make sure that the questions that you all have are being responded to. So the first question that came up was, can you talk about the current investment from U of M in cities like Detroit, Ypsilanti and Flint, specifically in providing financial support and vaccine distribution? What are ways to better support these communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID and also don't have the access to vaccines in the way we do here in Ann Arbor. So now one thing I'm going to mention and I answer this question is that those of us on this panel may seem as though we have more questions ourselves than answers because we represent certain facets of this community. And I think what's important and what I hope and what we hope comes from this panel discussion here is not that we are the ones that have all the answers, but that the institution listens to this conversation and recognizes that these are the questions that our communities have. So we have had this same conversation before, and I will put my name out there by saying that I actually challenged our institution to see what we were doing in the communities right in our backyard. Because we don't have to, not that we don't want to support Detroit, but we don't even have to go as far as Detroit to seeing the disparities that are existing in our communities. Now, I know that there are things our institution is doing I may not know all of them, but I think therein lies the problem. Because if me at this institution, I'm not exactly sure of all the things that we are doing, then the perception that our community is going to have is even less than that. 
And so we either are not doing enough or we need to do a better job of them promoting the things that we do so the community can know. I know that Dr. Wixon had a few things that, you know, in his role and in some of the scope that he has here that he may be able to chime in on as well. But that is just once again, not as institutional representative, but as community member Fermi. That is the way I feel sometimes about some of the things that we do or do not do and how that impact must be felt within the communities as well. Dr. Wixon. Yeah, the, to answer that question as well, you know, I, I do believe that Michigan Medicine held some pop up vaccination clinics and uh, you know, in some outlying communities and to, and to increase accessibility. Um, and I also, you know, I think that we've all seen the, the complexity that vaccine distribution has been in our country, uh, certainly. And um, it's really challenging, you know, as, as Dr. O brought up, how do you talk about it? How do you increase access? How do you um, prioritize? Um, and, and we're going to talk about this later, but certainly, you know, as a state and as a country, there, you know, disparities continue to be amplified, you know, despite us talking about them for the last year uh, throughout COVID-19. So, um, Dr. Burns, I think you had a, a point to add as well. Um, well, number one, I'm down in the city trying to make it happen. So I represent the School of Nursing, and I've, like I said, I've been down there for a long time, and we're really trying to you know, and I'll mention it later, work with churches, um, work with federally qualified health centers to make sure that people are getting the care that they need. It just needs to be publicized more. Um, also, you know, we have the Detroit Urban Research Center that has different connections with obvious, with the School of Public Health, um, with different Latinx communities, black and brown communities. We have the Detroit Center downtown. I mean, there are a lot of folks who are really trying to get together to help the people in the city, at least for Detroit. I'm speaking specifically for Detroit. Um, and so we're, we're working on it. Now, how fast we're doing it, that's another question. And I know clinically, um, you know, I teach a community clinical and public health um, in the School of Nursing. We have been working, our students have been working at COVID vaccination clinics in Washtenaw County. I mean, we are, we are set for Detroit Public uh, Schools Community District. We are trying to make change. But again, some of those things are inhibited by policy and procedure and other people's, you know, their rules and, and those things like that. So I hope that provides some answer to your question below. Yeah, building off of that, as a medical student, I was able to do a rotation at the Washtenaw County Health Department last month, actually, and work in their vaccination clinics and learn a little bit more about their efforts. And something about vaccine distribution is like the CDC phases and who's eligible to get the vaccine at this time. And a lot of it has been like first responders for that first month, right? And so um, what Michigan was able to do is one, like vaccinate their first responders. And then let's say there were slots that weren't filled or vaccine that had been out in no-shows, they would then send those vaccines to like the Washtenaw County Health Department and then get those distributed out into the uh, community or whoever was able to qualify for the vaccine at that time. And so making sure we're not wasting any of the limited vaccine that we already have by sharing that supply with the community. Thank you everyone for chiming in there. I think that those are wonderful examples of the fact that the institution is doing things to try to then address these things, but we don't always get the opportunity to then share and show how that's happening. So this does not absolve us of the need to do more, but I think it's also important for us to see that there are individuals that are on this panel and then their colleagues and partners across the institution that are trying to do things to address that. But you know, unfortunately, what seems to always get the headlines is the negative, right? Too often the negative is what we hear only because Unfortunately, that is sometimes the prevailing sentiment of what people feel, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something being done. So I think that a lot of us are proud about the steps that the university is taking. You know, Eris talked about students, and I've mentioned that students have been the ones pioneering a lot of this work, which I'll say later on. And there have been multiple students across all of our schools and colleges here, from public health to nursing to medicine, that have created solutions and have been trying to address some of these gaps, because I think that you know, they sometimes are feeling it more directly, or at least seem to be more vocal about how they feel it. And I think that that has, you know, trickled up to a lot of the work that's being done. Now, we started talking about the vaccine already. And now that we have more than one COVID vaccine, many people see this as the light at the end of the tunnel. But there are just as many, if not more people that are still hesitant to take the vaccine. 
especially individuals within BIPOC communities. Now, some believe that this is because of medical mistrust and misinformation about the vaccine. Dr. Burns, how do we begin to address these concepts of mistrust and misinformation? That's a very good question, um, Dr. O, and that should be threaded in everything that people do when it comes to this particular topic. Um, so again, it's deeper than the vaccine. It's, it's the whole healthcare system. The way communities of color are treated, the way information is explained, um, you know, it's not always explained appropriately, you know, and, and education level doesn't, doesn't matter um, in terms of the way it's, it's provided. Um, you know, patients are talked at, they're, you know, um, you know, they're not explaining their plan of care, and it puts a high level of isolation sometimes that breeds mistrust. Now, Eris uh, mentioned uh, what we call the ghost of Tuskegee and some other events, unethical events that have happened to the Black community. But we, what we need to think of is the actual definition of what mistrust is, and I'm just going to kind of break it down. Um, there was a great systematic review that we can drop in the chat that is from our our uh, next door colleagues at Wayne State University, I would like to give a shout out to Dr. Daniela Knuckles. Um, but it's more, broad, it's, it's broad, it's a cultural mistrust and it's defined as a tendency to distrust medical, uh, medical systems uh, and personnel believed to represent the dominant culture. There's a factor of what we call exposure, that this includes exposure to racism, maltreatment, or a hostile social environment. All of these can, can increase mistrust and, and they can experience one or all three of those things. There is a group distrust, so distrust those distrust those who do not belong to their um, group, their ethnic group, um, based upon a legacy of racism or unfair treatment of their group. And Blacks um, and the Black community are not the only groups that uh, face mistrust. This is in marginalized, vulnerable populations, Latinx, American Indians, those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, the LGBTQ plus community. And while complex, we have to look at the attitudes um, and the different reactions. So there's mistrust, as I mentioned, of the health system as a, as a whole. So, you know, not necessarily going to like, there's a free clinic available or a clinic around the corner or down the street, people just don't want to go. Then there's a specific healthcare system defining where you want to go. I'm, I'm going, and I'm specifically speaking of Southeast Mich Michigan, I'm going to go to DMC, the Detroit Medical Center versus maybe even Michigan Medicine or vice versa. Um, then there's healthcare providers, if they've had a, a specific experience, and this includes bedside manner, um, you know, bias may be a, a, a factor. And, and then last, mistrust, um, uh, those who have never entered the healthcare system because of intergenerational information. And what this, mean is, what this means is what grandma says or what auntie says. And that's, you know, sometimes why people do not go. And so then we have to look at the larger issue, you know, once we understand and acknowledge is how are we going to help these folks, you know, our folks manage, like, chronic conditions. And so, you know, things and solutions, we can, we can talk more about that later, but having thought leaders and um, messages crafted for the community and talking to the community about what is safe, what is important. And those are, what, those are some of the things that we need to consider further. Thank you. So before I toss this over to Dr. Wixon, I'm going to tell you that some of the things I've heard, right? I have people that talk about Tuskegee, right? Tuskegee is something that maybe a lot of people don't know, right? But to be very direct, in the Tuskegee experiments was the study of syphilis in the African-American Negro. At the beginning of this, we did not have a cure for syphilis. During the process, we then developed a cure for syphilis. We did not tell men that then had syphilis, that they had syphilis, and that we had treatment for it. And so there are men that were continued to be enrolled in this study that were tested and studied and were positive for syphilis and we had a treatment and we withheld it from them. This study was done by the United States health system. This was something done within the lifespan of people that are still alive today. And so when people talk about mistrust, we have to understand where it sometimes comes from. But then, what happens right now, because this is the conversation that people are having today, is that we talk about these disparities in care. We talk about lack of access to care, but then people talk about mistrust. And what I hear is that people say, you know, why is it that black people just don't trust this system? 
And here we are, we're trying to help them, but they're not availing themselves of these opportunities. And there's gonna continue to be these disparities because these black folk just don't want to get the medicine. There's nothing that we can do because they just don't wanna get it, right? Now, despite the unfortunate reality that specific actions, both past and present, have contributed to people's beliefs that black lives do not matter. Dr. Wixon, you volunteered for a COVID-19 vaccine trial last year. What made you volunteer? I mean, what I wanna say is, how Sway? I did. Um, so I was in the Johnson & Johnson Ensemble trial. That's a uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals is their vaccine uh, division. And, uh, it was a, a hard decision to be completely honest, uh, but at the end of the day, I felt a weighty responsibility uh, to participate. You know, I'm a black male physician of which 2% of the physicians in America are, you know, um, and I felt that I could have an outsized influence if I were willing to participate. Um, but it, was, it wasn't an, an easy decision. Um, I trust the science. I still trust the science. I'm so excited that the Johnson Johnson uh, data goes up uh, for review Friday. Uh, I just saw a news article right before we started today that it is safe and it is effective. Um, but I felt that I could use my position, you know, as a black male anesthesiologist who has been taking care of COVID patients since day one. Uh, of the pandemic um, to say, I trust the science. I trust this process so much so that I'm willing to put myself into an experiment um, to show that I really do believe in this. And I did my homework. I talked to uh, Dr. Logogo, the study director on the phone several times and said, what about this? What about this? What have you seen here? Um, and she, went through every single question that I had. And ultimately at the end of the day, again, I just felt I can do my part to help end the pandemic. Number one is a, is a study volunteer, uh, you know, is an N of one of the 30,000 that they need. That's a small portion I can do, but I can have a bigger influence by being public about getting that, getting the vaccine trial. I had the good fortune to, you know, share my story with Michigan Medicine's newsletter to really show, um, to show that I am doing this uh, and I, I believe in it. Um, it turns out they ended up getting placebo as I got unblinded. And then I got the Pfizer vaccine the day it was available to me. It was two days before Christmas uh, this past year uh, in phase 1A. Um, and it was an emotional weighty day to be completely honest. You know, as an anesthesiologist, um, we're uniquely positioned to care for patients in a respiratory pandemic. And so I spent a lot of time over the past year, you know, taking care of patients um, in the early days, thinking about, is it safe for me to go home and see my three month old son at the time? Should I move to a hotel for the next three months? Um, so sitting there getting my vaccine though, that's what I was thinking about um, is, is the kind nurse was jamming it in my arm. It was this elation and this the sigh of relief. Um, I didn't really sigh until I got dose number two. Uh, and then 10 days later, I said, okay, I, I think that I'm going to be okay. Um, but that, that's why I, why I participate. And that's why I talk to every single patient I see. I say, are you planning on getting the COVID vaccine? Whether they're a person of color or not, every single patient I say, are you going to get vaccinated when it's your turn? And if they say no, or I don't know, I say, let's talk about it because I can have influence in that one patient's life in that moment before they have an operation to dispel misinformation, to share my story about being vaccinated um, and hopefully contribute you know, to greater trust in the process. Thanks, Dr. Wixson. You know, that's one of the questions people ask. They said, for those who are vaccinated, this is coming from the Q&A, what resources gave you confidence in the vaccine for our community, since as you've mentioned, our community has been more systematically targeted in the past. You know, and I, I think that the name of this process, right, Operation Warp Speed, 
I think that that gave people some additional sort of trepidation because they felt as though, wait a minute, so you now sped through some process in warp speed, and the last time y'all had some vaccination, you when you when you had it, you didn't give it to us, and now you want to test us. We don't want to be your test guinea guinea pigs anymore. We don't want to be the people that you test this on as you talk about the fact that there's not enough data, right? And so I, I think that what we need to talk about, however, is that this vaccine process did not skip any steps. I think that warp speed gives people the impression that we skipped steps and that we don't have the information that we need. Instead, what it was is that we have a global pandemic that allowed all of our focus to be put towards creating a vaccine that is going to do the best that we can do with the information that we have, which is all we ever do in medicine. And so I actually really love the fact that people are asking more questions because in reality, people don't ask questions about most of what happens in medicine. And that's why most people don't go into nursing or public health or medicine. There's a lot of schooling and training that goes into being able to fully understand the implications of those decisions. But as people in healthcare, it is our responsibility to communicate that information in a way that the communities can receive it. And that is our responsibility. So I don't expect everyone to know every single thing about what goes into the vaccine. But at the same time, what I, and depending on the setting I'm in, right, if it's in the barbershop, I might have a different conversation. But I tell people, listen, let's just use Ann Arbor right now. If any of you have ever been to insert local restaurant, bar, club, anything here, and you ate or drank something that someone made in a kitchen somewhere, you don't always know what was in that. Right? And so I think the question is a good question, but do we put that same amount of concern around other things that we put in our bodies that do not have the same rigorous course of coming up with this vaccine? That people around the world were putting their heads together to try to determine a way to do this in a way that I, in my short years, I have not seen that type of concerted effort towards a global answer that we needed. But Dr. Burns, once again, I'm just N of one. You took the vaccine. So what were some of the reasons that you decided to do so in addition to what Dr. Wixson has said? Um, it I believe in science. Number one, I believe in science. There's been so many other things that have happened throughout the course of my life. I know that science works. Another reason is that this is like, you were talking about the warp speed, um, like this is this is COVID nineteen, the SARS CoV you know two. Um, there are other viruses that have you know been before this. When we look at H one N one and and some of the other things that have been down the line, um, this is this isn't something that oh this is one one virus and we're just going to get an immune you know a vaccination for it or whatnot. So I knew that there was evidence of other things that that have been worked on uh, in, in previous. Um, also for my family. I know my people were scared. I know, you know, they were scared. And I have a lot of folks in my family who are, who, you know, who are above that age of 65, who do have a chronic condition, who've had COVID. And if I could get it, I wanted to be that person, you know, to show that it's okay and it's safe. And with all the data that has been, you know, um, that has come out as well. And so the last thing I wanted to say is that I did, I put it out on social media, um, you know, and, and I just put out there, I said, if you have any questions, ask me. And I got, it wasn't all on social media, but I got so many text messages, so many direct messages. And I also had a colleague um, who is a pediatrician. He, you know, and this was everybody, a lot of folks were doing this and he got the shot, you know, the, you know, administered. And he had 2000, almost 2000 people view that, you know, and he is a trusted provider. So, I mean, so yeah, those are a few of the reasons. Thank you. Thank you both. And if some of you are not familiar, you know, the University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine put out a video that then had some of our, you know, African American and non African American providers speaking about the reason. And actually, now that I think about it, Miss Ayers Bryant was also in that video as well. So I think that we can try to provide that resource. We can get that link and put that link in at some point to show people that we had institutional leaders that were then talking about why they were going to or had already taken the COVID-19 vaccine. So, and I wanna say that for those of you that might be tuning in, 
it is okay to be scared because there are a lot of things that play into this decision that you don't necessarily have years of training to try to get what it was that was that was happening to then make this possible. And I think that being able to then turn to people and ask those questions is what's important. And I don't want to launch into this whole conversation, but that is, I think, what speaks to the importance of having representation in all spaces of you know, healthcare, whether it's from a student to a PA, to a nurse, to a physician, to anyone, because unfortunately, we talk about sort of racial concordance and people having comfort and then listening to people that look like them. And while I do not think it is impossible for you to then believe or listen to or trust someone that doesn't look like you, and I think it's actually of utmost importance that we get to the point that we can listen to, believe, and trust people that do not look like us. Due to some of the historical things that have occurred, it is going to require that we have some of that concordance to get us to the place where everyone else should be trusted. Because one of the things I tell people is that the past may not be your fault. So I'm not pointing at every single white person in the audience and saying the past was your fault. But what I do tell people is that regardless of what the past was, the future will be your fault. If we don't come together now to address some of these iniquities and then figure out how we can move forward together. So this brings us to probably the most important question of this topic now is how do we address these issues? We often discuss problems like this, but then we leave without any steps that we can take to actually address them. So since I imagine that everyone will wanna jump in on this question, let's start with our student participants, because as I said, I have seen a lot of the intentional action items and activism being led by our students. So Eris, how do you think we can address some of these disparities? Thank you. So this is something that I am very, very passionate about. Um, and every day I think as a medical student and as a future physician, what is it that I can do myself? And I think that this is something that can speak to if, if there are other medical students out there, other doctors, whether they look like me or they don't, whether they're from where I'm from or they're not, is making sure that we have patient-centered conversations with our patients when we're talking to them about their health. Making sure that we value their opinion and their experiences as much as we value our knowledge and our training. I think that it is important that we validate our patients and their experiences. If, if there are patients who come in and they say, I, I, don't, I just don't trust it, and I just don't trust it. Based off of whatever, like how my people have been in the country, I don't trust it. Like not forcing the issue, making sure we realize that, okay, I, I get that. Let me, let me build some rapport with you. Let me try to understand why you don't. Let, let, me, let me see if I can tap into what's causing you to feel this way. And if, the, if I have an answer that can make you feel more comfortable with the situation. I know that, that for me in the vaccine, I, I, was, I was skeptical at first, especially as a black woman in America um, and, and knowing about the history of, of my people here in this country. And, and it was me being able to have the training and understand the science behind the vaccine, me being able to analyze the studies and me having mentors who look like me and who, who don't look like me, who I trusted and could go to and talk about the vaccine. So, and, and that goes for all health, whether it's going in for your checkup, for your medications, we have to work on building trust with our patients and with their communities. Um, and then the other thing is building off of, of where mistrust can come from, whether it's the dominant culture or these other people who don't look like me, or, or I've had these experiences and now I, I don't trust it. And so I don't want you, my, my people to trust it either. It, it's a matter of, increasing representation in medicine. Um, I, I can build trust with my community because they know me. They, they grew up with me. They, they know what I'm about. They know I care about them. And, and while they may have been apprehensive about it at first, they're like, okay, why, why do you trust it? You, you know my values. You know what I stand for. Do you, do you think I should trust it too? And I can give them information to help them come to that decision themselves. And so I think something I'm very passionate about is mentoring and increasing pipeline efforts of getting more, getting more Black doctors into, into the um, healthcare system, getting more Black nurses, more PAs. More of us need to be in this space in order to improve these disparities, in order to improve our comfortability with healthcare. And so I think, yeah, just having honest conversations and increasing representation are two ways that I personally am trying to impact this, this area, and I think other people can do the same. 
Thank you, Eris. And now, Kendi, you know, from once again, a, a public health perspective, given that you are that representative for us on this panel, what do you think can be done to then impact change from that lens? Thank you, Dr. O. Um, a few things can be done from the public health field. Um, and for example, um, health behavior and health education, public health professionals should seek to um, encourage healthy and health seeking behaviors among black communities that will um, make black community members less susceptible to COVID-19 disease and less susceptible to the pre-existing conditions that make black Americans more susceptible to um, severe illness, which um, black Americans also disproportionately suffer from. So for example, asthma and heart disease, um, promoting behaviors such as not smoking and eating healthy and exercising. Um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, um, I believe that epidemiologists should um, spend more time studying the distribution of disease and disease burden in Black communities in, a, in addition to making efforts to improve them. Um, for public health policymakers, um, policies need to be created in order to provide more adequate resources in Black cities and communities during this time. So increased funding and more physicians and more hospitals hospital space, et cetera. And ultimately we need to address the root cause of these alarming racial disparities. So there have been a lot of proposed solutions to improve the determinants of health that put black Americans at a, at a disadvantage. But as our country was built on a foundation of disadvantage, it is difficult for black Americans to catch up. And um, ultimately I believe that this is also the responsibility of policymakers as well to create policies that address the conditions that lead to poor health outcomes in specific minority communities. Thank you, Kennedy. And Dr. Burns, and I'm, I'm sure you have some more things to add given you know, your, your dedicated work in these communities. So what are some of the things that we can do specifically? Okay, so I, I had to mention the church the role of the Black church is very, very important to the Black community. Um, it is and still is the social cohesion for the Black community. Um, faith is very important for folks to understand. It's the thread that has kept Black folks together um, is, and, and their trusted leaders, their pastors. Um, working with churches is very important. I know that um, there has been several churches, at least in Michigan, who've been on nationally on just to talk about what we can do together in terms of efforts to improve vaccination and trust and those type of things. Um, I don't know about you all, but um, I got a bunch of text messages last week about the, the Black church. This is our story, the PBS special. And that was something that was very important to folks for people to understand the history and legacy. So I think one thing to think about is um, the same way that we looked at voting this year, how we use that same grassroots structure, going door to door and talking to people, telling them that they are important and that we need them, using the organizations that have been long built, um, you know, that we, you know, that were created a while ago, such as the NAACP, the Divine Nine Fraternity and Sororities, the Urban League, all to mobilize um, this action, you know, to bridge, um, you know, to, you know, solve some of these barriers um, and, you know, get together so that we can make sure that the information is out there. So yeah, community leaders need to work with, you know, and, and from an interdisciplinary perspective, that's also important too, like how we're all here today, medicine, nursing, um, let's not forget pharmacy, uh, psychology, there's a lot of mental health stuff going on, community health workers, all of us need to work together with the community to make, these, to make these things happen. And then we also need to provide those messages from trusted leaders so that they understand that it's okay to get vaccinated and that care needs to be better. Thank you, Dr. Burns. And you know, Dr. Wixon, to sort of piggyback to that, I'll tie that in with a question that we had submitted before this, which was specifically about how healthcare professionals can best work to establish trust. So kind of pulling that all together, what, what do you think we can do in that respect? That's a great question. For me, I think that we need to learn as healthcare professionals to be vulnerable, to know we don't have all the answers, but to be able to share our story with our patients, to really listen to them more than we're, than we're talking. You know, when we hear, you know, glimmers of hesitancy or concern, you know, to not just say, oh, they're a non-compliant patient 
or you know they're listening to a conspiracy theory, but to say why are you why do you think that, or what's the barrier to you, you know moving forward whether it's with a treatment or with vaccination, um, you know I think that we really need to have a, a paradigm shift in how we talk about patients and how we interact with them. You know, for me to be able to say to a patient, yeah, I was a little bit nervous, to be honest, when I got that vaccine. I trust science, I believe in science. I think science is incredible. I understand why science changes. That literally is the definition of science is learning new things that change what you knew the day before. But even with all of that, I was still a little bit nervous. And I think that at times we wanna hold that back. We wanna you know, keep everything close to the chest and not let anyone know that you were concerned or you were scared or you're nervous or you have questions. But I think we need to do the exact opposite. I think we need to say, I hear you, I felt that too. And all of a sudden you just see this connection come, you know, where they just, your entire interaction changes and you start to build that relationship. Um, and that may be a relationship that you build for the 10 minutes before you drift them off to sleep for the operation or a relationship that you're going to have for the next 18 years as you care for their entire family. But I think it, it really comes down to being open, being honest, being vulnerable, and really listening. Um, and all of that takes time, um, which is then the biggest, the biggest challenge. You know, Dr. Wixon, you used a phrase, you said paradigm shift. And that's perfect because one of the questions that came from the community was this one. It said, this year's change in U.S. administration is a paradigm shift towards increased concern and caring about marginalized communities. How best to convey this concern and to establish trust in new policies of caring for heretofore neglected minorities? Is there a toolbox healthcare professionals can use for this purpose. So really once again, to summarize, people were asking that if this is a paradigm shift towards caring for marginalized communities, how do we then convey that this concern is real? And what can we do as healthcare providers or as anyone, is there some toolbox that then people can use to then address these things? Now, I'll say that institutionally, I will turn to the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. Right? We have an office at this organ at our institution that has long been doing a lot of this work. And it's not the responsibility of that office alone, but that office is well connected to other resources across our institution to address this. Now, I know that something that I've heard a lot of in the past few weeks, months, and you know, since we've been here is that people are surprised. They're surprised to then hear of some of these things. Many departments at Michigan Medicine just screened a film called Black Men in White Coats by Dr. Dale Okorodudu, which talks about the fact that less than 2% of the sort of a physicians are Black men and all of the sort of the downstream sort of consequences of that. And many people were surprised. The words that people used were shocked, disgusted, surprised. And so for those people that are surprised, they always want to know what can we do and where should we turn, but sometimes that turns into people trying to do things that they are not equipped to do. And it's with good intention, but I think that they fail to then support the programs that already exist and the infrastructure that is there to do so. So between David Brown, Dr. David Brown, who's our Vice President and Associate Dean for Health Equity and Inclusion at this institution, who runs this organization and trying to do that work, between Dr. Erica Newman, who has a leadership position in health equity for Michigan Medicine, with Dr. Rob Sellers, who's the chief diversity officer for the entire institution, there are structures in place here at Michigan that people can then plug into, because while this may surprise some people, this is not a surprise to those in our institution that have been doing this work. And it is not new for them to be dedicating efforts towards it, but this is the time to then pour your support and your resources into those existing structures, because that is what will make these solutions sustainable. Because I'll tell you that from my standpoint, I feel as though there are a lot of people that have a groundswell of interest in this work right now, but my concern is that they will fall away in a few weeks, months, years, where this is no longer vogue where it's no longer something that you get bonus points 
for suddenly realizing that diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. And so this is the time to support OHE. This is the time to support Dr. Rob Seller's office of O'Day. This is the time to support the individuals who have been doing this work. And I'm sure that we can provide some of those resources in this institution for those that don't know where those things exist to then do that. It's not that we don't want you to then independently come up with solutions on your own, but rather than doing that and creating silos, this is the time to build bridges because our communities need us our entire world needs us. And while we talked about black and brown communities today, by doing this, we're not just going to improve the care for those communities, we're going to be improving the care for all communities. Because that too often is what people think that when we sort of fraction off one specific group, that it seems as though we only care about that one group. Saying black lives matter does not mean that all lives don't. But when historically we have seen that certain lives do not, there needs to be some intentionality around creating solutions for that. Because like Dr. Dale says at the end of his movie, what is going to happen if we don't do a better job of getting more black men in white coats? And he said, more black people are gonna to continue to die. So if anybody else on this panel wants to address that last point, I will sort of leave that to the team. I know that some people, I know that Eris had an idea on there. So if Eris wants to chime in what you put in the chat, you can speak out to it as well. And then we'll wrap it up in a couple minutes here. Yes, I, um, I actually was able to participate in what is called Vote, vote ER. Um, and so as a health professional, whether you're a doctor, nurse, physical therapist, whatever, um, you can get an ID card that you can use with your patients or anyone in the community and they can scan it and they can help them register to vote. And so while we can have an impact within our health systems, we can, we can do as much as we can. As, as we spoke earlier, a lot of the things that determine these health disparities are systematic. In order for us to have an impact in thinking about this new administration, we need to make sure it, it, it's nice and dandy to talk about these things, but you need to put actions behind your words. And so we need to hold our elected officials accountable, use your right to vote, and then empower your patients to do the same. Um, I put a link, which is um, bot-er.org. Um, and you can go there to check out that resource. Thank you, Eris. And I know Dr. Burns would like to have a closing comment. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to just say a few quick points, um, you know, just about all of this, but um, the main my, the main message that I, I truly wanted to convey today was, you know, as a panelist, uh, is just the importance of getting the vaccine out there to communities that have been the hardest hit by COVID-19. And we really need to leverage the relationships with professional organizations, um, you know, and the, the, the grassroots organizations to push this movement forward. We need to use consistent, respectful, accurate communication to earn, secure, and maintain trust, you know, with, with, with our people. Um, and understand that we need to work together on multiple levels. We need to include everybody from the community to the academic, to our, our healthcare profession. And I also wanted to say, don't forget about, about our youth as they have been hit hard uh, during this pandemic when we look at education, trauma, and mental health. I know we, that's a whole nother subject, but that is my heart. Thank you. I wanna thank our panelists for taking the time to engage in this crucial conversation while also giving thanks to our wonderful institution for providing this platform to engage in this very important conversation that I only hope will continue after this ends. Thank you all for tuning in, stay safe, and as always, go blue.